Edo Arctic 2, Polar Research for Education, innovative program in Poland and Norway. Webinars. Today we are going to talk about zooplankton. Zooplankton, especially in the Arctic, but of course, in order to move to this region, first we need to discuss what zooplankton is. So, first, what is plankton in general? So, the term plankton is used to describe a group of organisms that live in water or in, in water or, or in moist environment in general and are carried along by, by currents, uh, by water movements. If it we're in the ocean, they are carried by waves and ocean currents without possibility, without the means to swim against them. So they are totally or practically totally dependent on water movements. So plankton uh, consists of a diverse range of living organisms and um, their main feature is that they spend at least part of their life cycle suspended in water. So this term plankton is further divided into phytoplankton and zooplankton, so meaning plant to animal drifters respectively. Uh, there are also other classifications of plankton and uh, other than uh, zooplankton and uh, phytoplankton. Uh, there is also so-called holoplankton, which refers to those organisms which spend their entire life life cycle as plankton in a planktonic form, as opposed to neuroplankton, which uh, are the planktonic organisms which are planktonic only for the part of their lives. And other organisms that are capable of resisting power currents of waves, such as fish or squid, are referred as nekton. And, and others that live near the bottom, near the ocean bed, for example, are bentos, which are, for example, sponges or Crabs. Also, planktonic uh, organisms are typically classified uh, into many size categories according uh, a scale, so called cerebral scale. Uh, so, it can uh, both phytoplankton and zooplankton can be divided based on their size. So, let's focus on the zooplankton now, uh, which are animals, of course, like larvae, jellyfish, or crustaceans. So the size. Uh, there is a quite a broad range of different size categories, starting with microplankton, which are mostly eggs or larvae, up to mega, which includes jellyfish. Uh, I already mentioned the habitat. So, uh, some organisms, some, plant, uh, some organisms spend their entire life cycle as a plankton, which is holoplankton, and some only a part of their life cycle, which is neuroplankton. Of course, many uh, different types and species of animals um, or um, animals belong to this category, uh, to zooplankton, from unicellular organisms up to giant gigantic jellyfish. So some important groups of organisms that belong to zooplankton are crustaceans, like copepods, krill, which uh, we should mostly associate with the southern or southern polar regions with the Antarctica. Um, jellies, worms and theropods. So it's Zooplankton includes representatives of many, many groups of marine fauna. And uh, one of the most, or maybe the most important group, is or are crustaceans. So, planktonic crustaceans are in many ways very similar or analogous to the insects on land. So, they typically dominate the communities, the planktonic uh, communities, representing a crucial link 
in oceanic food chains. As you can see eh, on this um, image, it is also a very, very diverse, diversified group. And the term uh, crustacean is derived from the Latin word crustaceus, uh, meaning having a shell or a crust. So this refers to the armor that envelops their bodies. And this armor is made from a very tough material called hitchy. And it's the same for insects on land. This external and very tough rigid skeleton restricts the growth process of, of this. So it must be first shed before an individual can increase in size. And growth and development of all crustaceans are achieved through a series of shedding or moths. And it's also common for the body or of an adult organism to be considerably different from to that of the young organ. Uh, but which organism, with which of the crustaceans is the most important? representative of zooplankton, especially in the Arctic. In other words, which organism is the most important, is the king of the Arctic. If we think of the king of the Arctic, what first comes to our mind is a polar bear, I would say, but actually king of the Arctic is much, much smaller and belongs to zooplankton. And it's, uh, it's called Canus glaciae. It's a true king of the earth. Uh, it is estimated that every liter of seawater contains between one and ten copepods because carbon glacier is, is, all, is a crustacean, but it is also a, a, a copepod. You see here. So those very little, very minuscule crustaceans have body like grain of ice, uh, so really, really small legs, shaped like oars, sometimes they have a very well developed eye like a telescope, and there are many, many species of plankton. It's about 2,000. It can be blue or red, colorless, luminescent, and uh, they can be herbivorous, omnivorous, carnivorous. They typically have an array of specialized feeding percentages that enable them to effectively uh, grasp their food from surrounding food. So copepods, copepods, and in the art, especially carnivores, glaciaris, represent a crucial like an interface between phytoplankton and next higher levels chains of food chain, food, food web, like fish. Uh, so they are open, like copepods, like carnivores, glaciers are often the first prey of fish larvae. So if we have a, a lot depends on healthy population of these tiny, it's essential for, for example, for healthy fish, for healthy fish stock, and from our point, human point of view, uh, also uh, it it uh, really, it is really crucial for how much fish we can uh, gain from, from the ocean. And fishery is a very important branch of economy for many countries. So, um, in parts of the northern Arctic region, this delicate balance of the food chain depends heavily on this top of Calanus glaciaris. is herbivorous. It means it eats plant, it eats phytoplankton. Phytoplankton rather than plants. Uh, and it is especially adapted to melting sea ice and the blooming of few small algal species. And like I said, this is uh, a very important, like crucial link, an interface between uh, phytoplankton and higher uh, levels of uh, higher trophic levels. Uh, in the Arctic food chain, the most important compound, like nutritional compound, are the omega-3 fatty acids. And these omega-3 fatty acids are produced exclusively by marine algae. 
sea life, algae, and phytoplankton. And so Canus gassianus graze on this algae, and so they are, and also they accumulate a lot of omega-3 acids, and they're a key source of those nutrients in the Arctic food change, chain. To survive the long Arctic winters, uh, Calanus glacial stores a large amount of fat, those lipids, which can amount to up to 70% of its body mass. So this lipid-rich, fatty-rich zooplankton is a primary food source for, for example, Arctic cod, marine birds, and some whales. And in turn, Arctic cod is the main course for seals, and seals are a preferable meal of polar bears. So there is a strict link between those two kings of the Arctic, the tiny one, the town of Gatsalis, and the large one, the polar bear. So what happens if climate changes? Because climate does change, and it's especially rapid and very visible in the Arctic. So um, there is a very delicate balance and a very uh, specific time period when things need to happen for the food chain to be in balance. So the Granus glacialis has a one to three years life cycle, depending on some factors such as temperature and food regime. There you have a lot of different uh, forms which are very different from the adult form, like nautli, cop copodites, and they follow a very pronounced seasonal migration pattern. And uh, the female, one female, hatches a lot of eggs, like 40, 80 eggs from one female. And remember, it's, it's the size of a rice grain, so the eggs need to be very, very small, they hatch into larvae and so on and so on. So one of these, um, they also have ability to delay the development if uh, they need to um, survive a very unfavorable, very unfavorable condition, and it is called by a house. So what happens normally? Normally, uh, there is a uh, there is a balance between the spring in the Arctic when everything blooms, and uh, there is an abundance of food in the form of granul glaciaris, for example, for little ox. But when there is a disruption caused by climate change, uh, the whole system collapses. So this is one of the examples uh, of the influence of climate change based on population of little ox. And their little ox are very important for the region for many reasons. For example, they create so-called onitogenic soils. They are made of their excrements. So they are very, they, they bring the nutrients from the ocean to, to, to land. So our little ox are very, very important uh, colony birds for the region. So um, if there is a mismatch between availability of this fat food preferred by little ox, which is Carnus glacialis, because the spring came too earlier, too early, because there was earlier ice melting, earlier algae bloom, Carnus glacialis cycle was more rapid. Uh, there isn't enough food when the little ox need it the most when they hatch, when they're uh, uh, need to feed their chicks, and this means uh, this means a lower survival rate of adult birds. So this little disruption and this not even the question of the amount of Calanus glacialis, but also the question of when it is available, when the abundance of this food is available, can disrupt the whole cycle can uh, be can in deprivation of the two oaks and have consequences even for uh, availability of nutrients on land. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, zooplankton uh, has different sizes from unicellular organisms to very large organisms, really, really large organisms like this one. So they're not all minuscule. They can be gigantic like this 
representatives so plankton is called lion's mane jellyfish yes it's a jellyfish uh, it is very large it can be bigger than, than a human uh, but it lives only for one year and of course it has no brain this is the largest species of jellyfish as a species in general this had been around very, very long time because I mean the individual has, has a lifespan of one year, but they appeared in the oceans about 650 million years ago, even before the dinosaurs. So dinosaurs are no longer with us, but jellyfish survived even without the brain. And they still populate our oceans today in many sizes and shade, uh, shapes, and they're very amazing creatures in general. But lion's main jellyfish is very special it's the largest species of jellyfish with its bell up to 12 meters across and gigantic tentacles up to 10 meters long uh, so uh, it, um, uh, lion's mane jellyfish uh, is quite colorful that's the name but it, so it may look like a tropical animal but it's um, native to cold waters of the Arctic, Northern Atlantic, Northern Pacific. Uh, it's a pelagic species found rather in open ocean waters and with higher salinity. And um, like I said, the name comes from the color of the colors of the red and yellow tentacles, which resemble the color of the lion's mane. Um, and the interesting thing is that jellyfish find environment that are affected or destroyed by humans very very favorable so they like it so overfishing climate change pollution help promote more frequent jellyfish appearance uh, while reducing their main predators they are not you know, they can look really scary if you meet them face to face uh, they are not dangerous humans however these things might be a little bit painful so again, to sum up, the most important part of today's meeting is Arctic Food Web based on omega-3 fatty uh, acids that look like this, uh, produced by marine algae, then uh, accumulated by cope pods such as Carmus glacialis, the most important one, and any disruption in the cycle can be very dangerous for the whole uh, for the whole system. And it is one of the problems with, with climate change. Also, uh, there are other problems because if uh, there is, if the ice, sea ice appears too early, uh, phytoplankton can be exposed to too much light, too much sunlight, and uh, too much uh, sunlight can cause some disruption in their production of omega-3 fatty acids. And again, food chain can be. Endangered. Uh, zooplankton has a variety of adaptations to quite difficult conditions in the Arctic uh, and in, in water in general, to live in water. So, um, all species of plankton in general were forced to develop certain structural adaptations to be able to float in the water column. So, they have rather flat bodies lateral legs. They have those own droplets that not only serve as food but also like a light vest to keep them floating. They also some have floats filled with gases um, and the, the, the flat bodies allow them to resist sinking by increasing the surface area of their bodies while, while minimizing the volume. So they can keep closer to the top the ocean and in, at the top of the ocean there is abundance of food which is phytoplankton because phytoplankton needs uh, light to, for photosynthesis to, to survive and uh, zooplankton have also adapted some mechanisms to like deter fish like their heaviest predator they have transparent bodies so they're more difficult to spot or bright colors to scare them away they have bad taste uh, or also uh, an ability to 
performs sort of cyclomorphosis. Cyclomorphosis occurs when predators, like fish, release chemicals in the water, like signals of lactam, uh, and then they can temporarily increase their protective uh, shields. These are only some of those adaptations. And one last very particular feature is vertical migration, dial or journal vertical migrations. So many crustaceans undertake daily migration, moving into the upper food rich waters at night, up and descending into the very dark depths uh, during the day. And this behavior continues throughout the winter, despite the surface layers have no more food. Uh, it is thought that this journal vertical migration is like a tactic to avoid predators that food using their site. Actually, it's the greatest migration in the world in terms of biomass. Uh, so it probably does occur during the polar night, during the polar day, we are not entirely sure whether it occurs or not. There, there are some there are some research sounds that show that zooplankton is still moving in the winter, but based not on the solar cycle but the moon's lunar cycle. Uh, it's a little bit uh, different. Moonlight is about one million times weaker than solar light. So it is actually unclear how zooplankton detects changes in its brightness, which are too small to be perceived by humans. But this is fascinating that it really does occur. It is really difficult to study this phenomenon during the polar night because it's polar night and no one wants to, the sea ice everywhere and no, no, no light whatsoever. And it's difficult to go on a ship and conduct some studies. But uh, this Vertical migration is a vertical migration is is an example of a movement because I started with it with the fact that zooplankton and plankton in general are unable to move on their own. But actually, this is a type of movement, vertical movement, that is very typical for them and especially typical for Arctic species. Thank you very much. That's it for today. Watch other recordings from webinars on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash edoarctic. Edoarctic 2, from polar research to scientific passion, innovative nature education in Poland and Norway receives a grant of 240,000 euros received from Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway under EEA funds.